At the end of the 19th century, Tibetans began to hear stories of the beginning of a glorious age, one in which the Russian Tsars would bring about a huge Buddhist empire, continuing through Mongolia and into Tibet. And they also heard that the Tsar was not only just converting to Buddhism, but was in fact the emanation of the White Tara, a Buddhist goddess for lack of a better term. This was all being taught by Agvan Dorzhiev, a Russian-born Buddhist who was not just some crazy man shouting from the hills, but was actually incredibly influential. He often met with the Dalai Lama and the Russian Tsars, plus given that he was spreading these ideas during the great game between the British and Russians in Asia, his teachings actually started a war. But first, White Tsar Generalissimo, Duke, Supreme Leader, Prince Elector, there's a whole host of titles out there for rulers, and sitting here today, you may think that they're constantly out of reach. But in my living room, there is a certificate proving to everyone that I have indeed joined the ranks of the nobility and became a lord. This was thanks to established titles, who give you at least one square foot of land in Edelston in Scotland. And because of little quirk in Scottish law, any landowner can be referred to as lairds, or lords or ladies in English. So once you buy up some land, you'll be given a unique number to find your exact plot, a crest, and the right to go around calling yourself a lord, including on credit cards, plane tickets, and even dating sites. So, established titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global restoration efforts. What's more is for every order, established titles plants a tree, and it also works with global charities. One tree planted, and trees for the future, to support global restoration efforts. So, as well as becoming a lord, you will help a great cause. And as we're coming into Christmas, this makes a great last minute gift, even for couples, as they also sell packs with adjoining plots of land. However, on this channel, let's push for more. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our own little jabsy kingdom. Plus, established titles is actually running a massive sale right now, and if you use the code JABSY, you get an additional 10% off. So go to establishedtitles.com slash JABSY to get your gifts now, and help support this channel as well as the environment. So the Russians had obviously expanded across the north of Asia, but very little was done to penetrate south towards Mongolia or China. Some people did push for it, like Ivan Jacobi in the 18th century, who was the governor of Irkutsk, but his plans were largely just ignored. However, by the late 19th century, the Russians began to grow ever more obsessed with conquering Asia. But not just because they could seize land, it almost became a matter of destiny. As Dostoevsky wrote, the name of the White Tsar must soar above the Khans and Emirs, above the Empress of India, above the name of the Caliph himself. In our future destinies, Asia is perhaps our main outlet. In Europe we are hangers-on and slaves, whereas we shall go to Asia as masters. This title though, the White Tsar, is a strange one and really a mysterious one. It's believed to have originated from the Golden Horde, and starting around the reign of Vasily III, Russian monarchs sometimes refer to themselves as the White Tsar when corresponding with Asian nations. But really, we're not all too sure where it came from, however, it began to grow in popularity in the 19th century. However, inside Russia, among the peasants, stories were told of a far-off utopia, the Oponskoya Kingdom, which lay at the edge of the flat world. This was ruled over by a white Tsar, who treated the peasants justly. Many wanderers were said to have actually travelled north, looking for such a place, but here you can see just how confused of a term it is, sometimes referring to mythical kings, sometimes the real Russian Tsar, derived from a Mongolian past. It's all very vague. Meanwhile, there was another term that was sometimes used among the Buddhists in Russia, the White Tara. One Buddhist group in Russia, the Buryats, have been in the news quite a lot recently, as you can often see them on the front lines in Ukraine. They are essentially Mongols, trapped on the wrong side of the border. Otherwise, there's the Kalmyks, who migrated from Asia to the Caucasus, and created the only Buddhist territory within Europe. 
but for this we're mainly going to focus on the Buryats. Anyway, in Buddhism there is the story of the Tara, a female bodhisattva or someone who has achieved enlightenment. She appears in many forms, usually different colours, and one of them was white, hence the term White Tara. As I'm no expert in Buddhist philosophy, I'm just going to quote Yuangdu experience Tibet here and say, Tibetans pray to White Tara especially for health, healing and longevity. She offers healing to our wounds, whether it is our bodies or our minds that have been hurt. So it is a largely Tibetan idea, but Tibetan Buddhism found its way over to Mongolia and therefore among the Buryat people. There the people are said to have bestowed this title on Catherine the Great initially. This was because she legitimised Buddhism in Russia in 1764. However, this comes from oral history, and sometimes the stories say that the first person to get that title was Empress Elizabeth, and some say earlier Tsars may have been given this title as well. So again, it's all pretty vague. Tibetan Buddhism also has their own myth of a utopia, which is called Shambhala. Here they believe that everybody is enlightened, and their king would come to save Tibet and Buddhism in times of stress. Although there's no real references that could link Russia to this place, many would begin to use this myth to justify Russian expansion. So there were two terms, the White Tara and the White Tsar. These began to be used interchangeably as the 19th century went on. Like in Central Asia, they would use the term White Tsar more, as it would show that the Romanov family were the successors of the Mongolian Empire, and thus justify their conquests. While in Buddhist Tibet, the White Tara would have been used more. One of the first explorers to begin using the term frequently was Nikolai Perzhevalsky. He made many journeys into the region, but never quite made it to Tibet. Nevertheless, he reported back that all the nations under Chinese control would quickly join the Tsar should an invasion take place. He actually also said that they hold the Tsar in a mythical light as the White Tsar. On his journeys, he encountered a Muslim rebellion against the Chinese in Xinjiang, known as the Dungan Revolt. But he argued that Lhasa in Tibet should be Russia's main goal. This is because, as he argued, bringing the Rome of Asia and the Dalai Lama on their side would also bring 200 million Buddhists under the Tsar's influence. Now a little bit off topic here, but later in Russian history, rumours began to circulate that this explorer was the illegitimate father of Stalin, given their obvious similarities. But back in Russia, Alexander III was not so keen on the idea of expanding into Asia. However, when Nicholas became Tsar, he changed policy. He had already been on a grand tour to Asia with the future Prime Minister, Sergei Vitter. And as Vitter noted in his memoirs, the Tsar, after claiming the title of the Emir of Bukhara, was obsessed with adding the titles of Bodgi Khan of China and Mikado of Japan to the titles he already held. Well, China was on the decline already, but also the Russians and British were engaged in the Great Game, a dispute over power and influence in Asia. Trapped in the middle of their growing empires were Afghanistan and Tibet. Agvan Dorzhev wasn't even the first Buryat to notice the opportunity presented here. The first Buryat was Peter Badmayev. He had already converted to the Orthodox Church, but studied in Tibet and brought back Tibetan medicine to the Russian court and served as a doctor to the Tsars. However, it wasn't just medicine that the Tsars were interested in, as with many Russian aristocrats, they were fascinated with the supernatural, as many leaders continue to be. As R. Philip Miller described the court at the time, medicine and politics, ministerial appointment and lotus essences became more and more mingled, and a fantastic political magic character arose, which emanated from Badmayev Sanatorium and determined the fate of all Russia. Anyone who took his medicaments ensured himself an important office in the state at that time. This strange mix of the supernatural and politics and the destiny of Russia is vital to look at when understanding their history. Obviously Tsar Nicholas had Rasputin, but also Stalin, despite being anti-religious, had Natalia Lvova. As Stalin's own mother said, she protected him from the evil eye and all of his enemies, and apparently she warned him never to have his photograph taken. 
Later in history, Brezhnev brought a faith healer to Moscow named Juna, and still today, it seems Putin has his own astrologers and mystics. Also, the Buryats seem to have associated Medvedev with the White Tara a decade or so ago. It's all very peculiar. Anyway, Badmayev tried to convince the Tsar numerous times to move into Mongolia and on to Tibet. In his words, the Chinese don't pay attention to who is ruling them. Not only do they ignore which nation is ruling their dynasty, they don't protest. This is a Chinese tradition still unknown to Europeans. Here he seems to be alluding to the fact that the Chinese were being ruled over by Manchus. To accomplish his goal of conquest, he set up a trading company and trading posts within North and West China. Then he planned to incite the locals in Tibet, Mongolia and East Turkestan to rebel against the Qing dynasty and then invite the Russians to invade. But these plans were rejected for being too far-fetched. So this whole story didn't begin with Dorzhev, yet he came around shortly afterwards and had the most profound effect on global events. Looking at Dorzhev, he left Russia to study in Tibet in the 1870s and there, after achieving the title Master of Buddhist Philosophy, he became a teacher and close associate of the 13th Dalai Lama. So obviously he gained quite a bit of influence, but many in the Tibetan court still favoured good relations with China. As Dorzhev himself put it, the Sinophiles did not dare to break connections with China, because on the one hand, for a period of 200 years, some 15,000 lands were allocated annually from the state treasury. On the other hand, the Tibetans still remembered China's financial and military assistance given to them during their war with the tribes of Balba, Gorka and Senba. Nevertheless, he worked hard spreading the idea that the future Tsar Nicholas treated Buddhists with respect. In fact, he said Nicholas heaped favours on them, and this considerably raised Russia's prestige among them, from the Dalai Lama and the highest officials down to the ordinary people, which naturally gave rise to an idea that such a Bodhisattva Tsar could also bestow his favour upon Tibet. Dorzhev then travelled to Russia, with six representatives from Tibet and met with the Tsar. There they received gifts for the Dalai Lama and weapons for their country, which further fanned the flames of these rumours. In 1901, Dorzhev also met with the Panchen Lama, and there he learned more on the myth of Shambhala, especially from writings of a former Panchen Lama. He took this myth in return to Tibet, where he argued that Tsarist Russia was in fact that mythical place a country that would come to rescue Tibet and Buddhism when it was in trouble. But again, Dorzhev wasn't alone in this. The Kalmyk Lama, Dambo Ulyanov, created a whole family tree for the Romanov house, which showed them as descendants of the Buddha or the rulers of Shambhala, depending on the source. And it was also around this time in 1900 that a Japanese monk named Ikai Kawaguchi travelled to Tibet. He reported that Dorzhev circulated a pamphlet in which he argued that the Russian Tsar was about to fulfil the old Buddhist messianic myth of Shambhala by founding a great Buddhist empire. However, the British were also beginning to see what was happening in Tibet. In British India, Lord Curzon had previously dismissed reports on Dorzhev as a fraud and believed that the Tibetans were far too xenophobic to ever make a deal with the Europeans. But now he panicked and, as he wrote, we cannot prevent Russia from taking Mongolia and Chinese Turkestan, though we may delay the latter a little. But I think we can and ought to stop a Russian protectorate over Tibet by being in advance ourselves. And to get ahead of the Russians, he ordered Indian troops to the Tibetan border in 1903. They found a rather pathetic cause for war, claiming that the Tibetans were hostile when they herded away Nepalese yaks that crossed their border. They then invaded the country and moved on to Lhasa. During this British expedition, Dorzhev convinced the Dalai Lama to flee to Urga in Mongolia, while the British believed wrongfully that Dorzhev was somehow in control of the Tibetan arsenals at Lhasa. However, this whole invasion took place without any authorization from London. So, almost as soon as it was concluded, the British government just handed the region back to China and the Dalai Lama returned home. Also, after this expedition, the Russians lost a war to Japan, weakening their prestige in Asia. 
However, this didn't stop Dorzhev, and he continued his work. He got permission to build a Buddhist temple in St. Petersburg, and a medical college at Astagat, and then he began to scheme again. By 1911, the Qing dynasty had been toppled, and Mongolia and Tibet were free. So Dorzhev, without any authorization from the Dalai Lama, signed a treaty of friendship with the Mongolians, recognizing their independence. But nothing really came of this, as the revolution came to Russia, and Dorzhev was initially sentenced to death by the Bolsheviks. However, he was saved, and even began to work with the Bolsheviks by turning monasteries into collective farms. He proposed granting Outer Mongolia more land, but this was rejected, and during Stalin's purges, he was eventually arrested for treason, allegedly working as a spy for the Mongolians and Japanese. By then though, he was already in his 80s, and he died in prison. His and other people's work though, seemed to have inspired a whole host of Russians who saw some sort of mythical connection between Russia and the Buddhist lands to the south. For instance, during the Russian Civil War, a white Russian named von Ungern Sternberg invaded Mongolia, chasing away the Chinese who tried to reclaim the province. He then restored the Bogdakhan to power, and had some bold plans for this country. He had actually been fascinated with Buddhism for a while, and potentially already set up links with the Dalai Lama, as his new armies in Mongolia did have Tibetans in them. However, these could have also been exiled Tibetans. Anyway, from this position, he hoped to almost restore the Mongolian Empire, which, in his mind, would stretch from the Pacific and Indian Oceans to the shore of the Volga, and the wise religion of the Buddha shall run to the north and the west. To do this, he carried out a number of brutal crimes, like he buried people alive, burned them at the stake, and even sentenced a baker to be baked to death in his own oven. But in his mind, he was the incarnated god of war and Khan of Grateful Mongolia. However, this too prompted another war, as the Soviets helped the communists of Mongolia come to power, and another Buddhist mystic of Russia fell before realizing their dream of empire. 